This week, we welcome comedian, filmmaker, and author Jenna Friedman. I thought that the stories about my experience, my personal experiences, if I could have like universal themes attached to them, that that maybe it would like resonate. And I also, I don't want to be like a political pundit. I don't know if yeah. I'm going to get shit, shit from some of the things I say on this podcast by your supporters. I hope they're still listening. I talk about cancel culture because it was like hard at the time to write a book about comedy and culture without talking about that kind of weird elephant in the room. But yeah, I mean, I, I hope that somebody who doesn't align with me politically will still appreciate what I'm saying in the book because it just really is my own experiences. It's not, I don't have like a larger agenda. This is Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Phetasy.com. You'll get access to behind the scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Phetasy.com. I'm with Jenna Friedman, everybody. Welcome to Walk-Ins. Welcome. I'm glad to have you and meet you. I feel yeah. like I've, I feel like I think, I feel like we've met, but maybe we just haven't. Maybe I just feel like I, I know you, but I think I've seen you. Maybe I just bumped into you in New York when I was with Adrian Appalucci one night and oh, I think you I were performing. Adrian. I know. I love her. She's oh, cool. Um, she's just the most fearless. <laughs> mm -hmm. She's so funny. I'm glad that she's, I think people are finally, there are these comedians, particularly female comedians who've been in New York doing comedy for decades and they're so funny. And I feel like only now people are kind of noticing or in the past five years with social, I mean, just kind of people are noticing how funny Liz Mealy is another one. Yes. She's just been doing it. Um, Anyway, how long have you been doing comedy? Since 2005. Wow. And wow, to be so obscure. <laughs> I've been done it now, for you're so not long. obscure, though, I don't think. I feel like you're pretty well known. I, I feel like you're, it, at least in the comedy world, you're very well known. And I think you. That's all well, I care about. That's all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, I have this feeling of obscurity because I, I, I interview a lot of people mainly men for this true crime show that I did. And I made a meal out of one of them literally not knowing who I was at all or my name, even though he sat down to be on my show. And my name is like <laughs> literally in the performance release that he signed to be on the show. And I was just like, do you like, like, it was just, it's this whole thing, but it was like, like, uh, what if this, what if uh, somebody wanted to be as successful as Nancy Grace, because he was her producer, how would you advise them? And then he started kind of like, you know, thinking about it and telling me and then I was and then he's like what's their name and I was like Jenna Friedman do you know who that is and he's like mm, I don't know maybe she should start with <laughs> podcasting <laughs> so I think it maybe has given me this complex and I'm like wow people do not but it's fine it's great it's actually great when I first had a I had a podcast before this podcast with a comedian co-host and we would have guests on to talk about relationship stuff and being single. I think you and I both have a history about writing for relations. I wrote like relationship advice for Playboy and I, that was crazy time to be writing for Playboy. And so this was around the time I had that podcast and this guy came on and I did no, I did no research. I just had him on, did no research. And then he was really tall and he came on the podcast and I was like, wow, you should be in the NBA. And he was like, I was in the NBA. <laughs> and he was so mad. And the rest of the interview was just like a disaster. I ended up, it was early on in the podcasting career of mine and I learned a lesson. <laughs> I love that. Lesson. <laughs> I think the, the, interviews where not like between two ferns where he like actively pretends to have no charisma with people and it's very hilarious but i think <laughs> the interviews where people have zero charisma are so much more enjoyable yeah they're fun i i like the ones though too where it is just like two people bantering and my favorite interviews 
I do such a smattering of interviews with people and my favorite are always with comedians because it does end up just talking about like the most random shit and it's not, and I don't have to feel like some kind of intellect or anything. And I do remember the, it was like the first time I ever did Rogan, he had just finished talking to Snowden. And then I walked in and they were still going and I was in the green room and I'm like, this is fucking ridiculous. Like, why are you talking to me? And he was like, I was like, well, it's me, an idiot. And he was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> like, it's a, it's a relief. Funny. Yeah, but it's a nice break. Yeah, from I do people think who are intellectual or yeah, like government agitators. Um, I it is cool that I like with almost all comedians, there is this. I don't know if it's like a language or just a way where you can really one on one just talk to people. And I don't know, like I, I that was one of the things during the pandemic I really missed that I didn't even realize I missed. Particularly when you live in New York, you're just like you run into people all the time those tiny conversations before and after shows where you just get so real with these people you see maybe like twice a year. Yeah. You know? and, and it's just this language of like, how are you doing? Oh, my wife left me, but <laughs> like, then, like you, you're just, you know, it, it's, uh, it's cool. I, I love our community of. Yeah. Communities. I've, I feel like I really miss it's one of the, I have like a weird relationship to it because I feel like I was never built for the grind. And it's one of the things I've always worried about. Maybe if I lived in New York, it, I probably would have kept grinding more than I did in LA because the driving for like four or five minutes was just crushing me. And then once I started getting paid to write and do building an online audience, I was like, is this time yeah. efficient at the moment <laughs> you know la is not a place to build a stand-up career or even really sustain it it's really it's hard la is a lot harder new york though you're running around there you're just like you know that would be like my exercise i would just like go to yeah. shows see friends like be out in the world it, it was just part of the kind of being out in new york anyway i wanted to ask you you had and this is completely just off topic but i was thinking about it and laughing about it when i saw you posted on twitter um you posted something about like letting your child cry it out <laughs> and there's this really funny instagram meme that my sister sent me and it's like a, it's it's kind of a veteran mom watching a new mom ask a question in like a community <laughs> about it's like oh let's see how this goes and that was exactly the feeling i had when you were like hey i'm thinking of letting my kid cry it out because i don't know what to do and i was like i'll get the popcorn let's see I, how this goes i just i've been i was i stopped tweeting but I was a little, I mean, you're crazy because you're not crazy. sleeping. So I yeah. just, I was on Twitter and this is so dark, but my mom died when I was pregnant. I was like, Oh God, um, I'm so it, sorry. It was over five weeks. It was pancreatic cancer. It still feels surreal to talk about, but I think I was like leaning on Twitter. Cause like, I didn't have her to call. So I was just like, I um, wish you had called me. I aw. seriously was going to be like, I, I DM'd you. I was like, look, if you need any. Oh, you did. I, I mean, I got a lot of DMs from people and I, I hope I responded, but I was just like, ah. I was crazy. such a, I think we had our kids around. I, I don't know how old your kid is, but I feel like they're like three months apart. Like, wow. I think you October, were. October, he was born. Okay. So a little more. She was born at the, basically the beginning of May. So, but yeah, wow. they're very close in age. So I saw, when I saw you tweeting about that, I was like oh my god i feel for her i've been in exactly this position and still wrestle with it by the way people still. yeah i mean people are coming out of the woodwork to the point where like i was tuning about breastfeeding mostly because i had no and i know this is like so gross to talk about but i didn't know until i was three months pregnant that it was like a 24-hour thing at first that you're just like constantly breastfeeding so you don't really sleep because if it's like if you do decide to breastfeed, which whatever, who cares? You don't, you don't need to. I'm, I actually wanted to do a podcast where I was, where I would like ask like Stephen Miller's mom if she breastfed it. You know, like I was just so curious about like, you know, like was Ben Shapiro breastfed? Sorry, <laughs> like was was uh, Richard Spencer breastfed? Just because you want to know like why am I doing this? Do I need to breastfeed this kid? But I did it for immunity stuff, whatever. But it was so 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 hard. And if it takes them like an hour to eat, and you have to do it every two to three hours, you literally are not sleeping. So I was losing my mind and then tweeting about it. And then I had people being like, oh, I want to send you a breastfeeding sweater. I want to send you a weird bra with a 
with a contraption that massage. And I'm, I'm like, I don't want to be a breastfeeding influencer. Like I'm shutting this shit down now. <laughs> and I haven't tweeted about it since. Oh yeah. The, the sleeping one. I just wrote a piece about how nothing is, it's like the thing that everyone judges you by as a parent. And even when we first started walking her around the neighborhood in the early like days of her being alive, she was weeks old and people were like, are you sleeping yet? It was the first question they asked. I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not sleeping yet. And she had colic. So she yeah. was, um, for like five or six weeks, it was like, I felt like I was the biggest failure in the entire, I got yeah. emotional thinking about that time. Yeah. And, he was um, the same way. Yeah, it was just and then I didn't know what to do about the sleeping thing. And it's like you re, there's so much information and it's so saturated and every single thing is like I had people DMing me and emailing me and telling me that I was traumatizing my daughter if I let her cry it out. And then there was there's lots of evidence that's like that's all bullshit. And it's like something that one person, you know, like Gabor Mate made up <laughs> from a, a loose study that is not is kind of not it, it's just so it's, there's so I said to my sister she had kids really young so she says she feels like a grandma now because her kids are on the way she has two that are pretty much done and one with like four more years to go and she's like I was like is it always been like this or is it just and she's like no it's the internet you know she was like this this is just social media and the internet it was not like this she was like when i was a mom we had like pillows and all kinds of shit in their cribs and blankets now it's like oh right well yeah no i had a, only you will appreciate this or, or moms but harvey carp the maker yeah. of the snoo slid into my yeah. dms <laughs> Because I was like, my baby doesn't like the snoo. And he slid into my DMs. He's like, have you tried tilting it? Like, here's a okay. link. And I was like, get the fuck out of here, Harvey Carp. <laughs> I even like trolled him at one point. He was like, I, I, I sent him a text back or stuff. Because it was so funny. And nobody will find this funny except for other moms. But I had I had like a typo in the in something I wrote him back and then I wrote back sorry for the typo I have my child and my my crying child in my hand because he doesn't like the snoo <laughs> <laughs> just like so mad so dumb yeah this, there's just so much I that's another piece that I'm writing right now is the like babies come with a lot of shit and it's all just about the registry and how overwhelmed well I hate so shopping. It was so overwhelming. I basically paid my sister to do it for me. And I just, none of the stuff made sense because it, I, it, it's yes. out of context. I still don't even know. I also, because of my, my mom thing, I just was like, I'm just going to lean into my grief. Like, <laughs> It was like, I totally was grieving, but it was also like a good excuse to just tune out the registry stuff. My yeah. husband did all of that. I didn't, the only thing I bought my son is a crocheted Metro card because so stupid but i was like <laughs> i'm a new yorker uh but everything else he has i don't even know where he got it or what it is it's god all... janet that is so fucking hard i don't know how you yeah i thought you were gonna say that you were so lucky <laughs> that you didn't that your mom died and you didn't know that's wedding just the baby registry stuff my OBGYN died when i was five weeks postpartum just random shocking like and he was like this beloved OBGYN oh in la and i think and i heard about that because i had a friend who was everyone also going had him. to him and yeah. she's like he died yeah and that was that was like a shocking thing yeah. to grieve and yeah. then I can't even that's like times a million I can't it's the worst, even imagine it's the it. worst. It, it all it just I can't talk about it too much because I will cry but it, it's the worst thing ever but at the same time and this is also dark but it's totally honest like I really wasn't sure that I wanted to have a kid it, it was not I was never somebody who was like I don't want it or I do want it yeah and at, my husband wanted it and I was like about to be 40 and I was, I didn't think it was going to happen because he smoked yeah. a lot of pot and I was 39. I was like, go, go ahead and try. And then like right away we got <laughs> pregnant and I was like not sold on it while I was pregnant. I was shooting a true crime show and a stand-up special and I was like, this is going to be good fodder for me. It's going to make my shit funnier, which is such a horrible thing to think. But telling abortion jokes with a baby attached like a fetus, whatever, is comedic. And yes. so, um, and, but then when my mom got sick and it happened so quickly, I, that was like the first moment that I was like, think I was so, I, it like, 
I just a switch like uh, went on in my brain and I was like, I'm so, I feel so lucky that I have this little guy in the, the worst moment of my life. Yeah. And then, so I just feel grateful. So I didn't get having, apparently you can get postpartum starting at nine months. Who knew? Huh? But I, I haven't, didn't know this <laughs> I haven't gotten it yet. I think because I was just, I had so much grief, but having a little cheery guy, it just kind of keeps her alive. And I don't know if I have pre- postpartum psychosis, but now I'm just like, I've gone through the stages of grief and now I'm just back to denial and I like talk to her and pretend she's alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean that, that, that's like a crazy intense thing to go through when you're pregnant. I just, that is, yeah. I'm very, I'm very sorry. I am, I am glad you had your husband doing your registry for you. Yeah, because... he was great. <laughs> he did it. He did everything. He was great. Yeah. And w- were you writing your book at the same time? Book. I finished. Where was that done? That was done. Okay. You've written, have you written a book? No, because I don't know what my problem is. No, no, no. It was something I wasn't able to do until like the Delta variant really helped me like uh, take time off from being outside (laughs) or like around people to write it. But um, yeah, I finished it. So my mom had always wanted me to write a book and I just kind of like tuned it out and I finished it and I got to read her the whole galleys copy, which is so artfully presented against my wall. Um, and, uh, I was so pregnant. I had a mask on cause it was when I, I, we still thought she would be able to get chemo and I didn't want her to get COVID. And I read her the whole book in two days, trying not to cry. And when I finished, she said, are you going to do a book on tape? And I was like, that's a plan. And then she said, well, you should pay someone to help you on the performance. <laughs> The book is about 15 years as a performer. And it was like, I laughed with her at the time. Like, I was just like, I love how like, and I didn't, I didn't know she was dying. Cause I actually, I, and I would, I don't want to talk too much, but I'm, I'm talking about it so much right now. But, um, I, it was like, I found out she was sick a day before I taped my stand up special. And if I had known that she was going to die in five weeks, I don't think I would have been able to do it. I thought like worst case, it was going to be two years. Yeah. But yeah. Life comes at you fast. Yeah, we can it does. move on. But I'm glad I got to re- like I all I, I I'm glad I got to read it to her. I'm glad she got to like she. I don't think I'm gonna have another moment in my career where I have like literally a stand-up special, a television show, and a book all about to come out and a baby. Like, there's never gonna be a moment where I have. So she got to, you know our relationship was the best it had ever been. She knew I'd be okay. So I have to like kind of. I hate the the G word. I hate the word gratitude because I live in LA and I feel like that word has been bastardized. And it's I thought like, you were oh, going to say God. <laughs> <laughs> what? Who's that? No, um, gratitude. Uh, <laughs> but like, and I'm only also talking about it publicly because I had never experienced this and it feels like jumping in a pool of freezing cold water and you're just like, what? So I do think it is important to talk about it uh, just for other people. But like personally, I, being able to have the gratitude for like the time that I had with her and also just, um, yeah. And, and talking to friends who had gone through it. Those are the two things that really have like helped. Yeah. That's, I mean, there's that expression. Somebody once said to me, you can't, you can, you can have it all, but you can't have it all at the same time. I feel like you are living proof that that's not true. <laughs> You're like, no, it actually all happened exactly in one moment so many life altering worldview changing things to happen at once. And I don't know. I mean, I I guess, yeah, you're probably still in like processing and now everyone's on strike. It's so weird with LA. I came to LA in 2007, right as the strike, the last strike started. And then I left as like my time in LA was bookmarked by writer's strikes. Yeah, it seems so weirdly appropriate. This one's crazy. I mean, yeah. it is, it's fun to be on the picket line. It feels like a party, but also like the, the threats are existential and they are in every industry. And a friend of mine likened our industry kind of to like an athlete union. Like as far as unions go, we are less vulnerable than I would say the teacher's union or the nurse's union. Um, and we're out there. And I, I want to believe that no matter how this goes, that we're fighting for everyone i think i think what's happening is happening in every single industry and it's just it's not even like technology is evolving get with it get used to it because like you saw with uber which is not exactly the same 
analogy or like analogous to what we're what's going on but like they went into new york they decimated the cab industry cab drivers used to be able to have a pretty good living but then they replaced it with something where it's like a gig economy but uber itself isn't even necessarily making money so there are these like disruptors but the finances don't even necessarily add up to a profit but then you have some ceos and people at the top just kind of like looting uh just taking money out of pre-existing not even economies i guess and it is there's a term for vulture capitalism but that's the other thing that i think is really interesting about this moment you have these like whatever eight to twelve studio executives and their salaries are like in the you know like 20 to 40 million range and they're not even making money for the companies that they're running they're just literally taking a pre-existing industry that like many many people could have comfortable middle class livings in and just looting it for themselves and not even bringing their shareholders profit. So, and tech, the tech is allowing them to do that. But yeah. so, yeah, so I really do believe in the strike and, and what we're trying to do. I don't know how it's going to go. I hope, I think if the DGA and it looks like SAG is kind of coming into our corner, but if the DGA also does, I think we'll have a lot of power. Yeah. But it's still to be determined. Yeah. There's, it seems like, I don't fully understand everything. It just seems like from my perspective as someone who's lived in LA for 15 years, you used to be able to make a living as like a middle class writer, but now the city itself has priced those people out, but the industry has priced those people out too. And it does seem like the writers are getting asked to do more and more drafts for essentially free and not yeah. getting the streaming thing is really the fucked. streaming thing just means that you don't so if you write a script that's your intellectual property but now a streaming you don't get money when other people see it and you're right it is a convergence of two things it's like the industry itself it's changing to a point where just there's less money to go around by nature of design of like the kind of people at the top doing that and the technology allowing them to do that but then on the other side of the coin you have like the housing crisis where you have, we were trying to buy a house before the pandemic. Uh, the, on this one house, there were 20 offers, 10 were all cash. It ended up going for 400 over asking price. And then whoever bought it, put it back on the market as an Airbnb. Oh, so whoever wow. bought it wasn't even living in it. It could have yeah. been a hedge fund. It might yeah. not have even been a person. Yeah. It could have been somebody from another country coming in and buying it. Like. And that has to do with the lack of regulations. And I don't want to sound like a socialist. I totally believe in capitalism, but it needs to be like regulated so you don't have people scamming or exploiting labor. Yeah, there's that situation that is occurring and so many, I see it in Joshua Tree, so many people moved in out of town and then also just got second rental properties from and they were just renting them all and everywhere you go there's like go back to LA and everywhere in America you go there's like go back to California um it does seem like this weird invasion of people I'm part of this problem um moving from LA to Texas now and I my I had family members who were probably I think they left in like 2017. So they were way ahead of the, but people have been leaving with in the middle class with families for a long time from California, just because they're getting priced out. And they said the same thing. They had two kids and they said what we were saying once we had our one, which was we'll never get ahead in this town ever. I mean, this is the nature of, of cities. And I mean, like my ancestors moved for like, this is just like the nature of like humans, you know, move and migrate because of certain things. But I also do think that there's like an outsized anger at individual like lib libtards or whatever, like people from LA moving when in reality, it's the system that is like, you know, it's like the uh, not to get too into it, but what neoliberal economic policies that like both the Democrats and the Republicans are guilty of it. They're, they're eroding the middle class. People aren't able to survive and people are angry. So they're trying to scapegoat other people when in reality, it's like, we just need a system that actually gives a shit about people and that taxes billionaires and puts that money back into 
uh, economies for people to have jobs and living wages. So problem yeah. solved. Problem solved. <laughs> Just like that. I'm familiar with it coming from very blue California, which is like a uniparty. But how how does and I'm this is just me being dumb. How how does it occur with the like right Republicans where they are eating the like how do they destroy the middle class with their policies? I know, I know it well. They're not taxing. They're not taxing. They don't want taxes on billionaires, so they're not like all the. And the other thing that's, so I did this piece at the Daily Show where we were like, I was a field producer there and it was a really cool job, but it was really hard because like we were doing a piece on uh, minimum wage, how you should have like living wages. And you're talking to people who are really struggling. They're working like five jobs and like uh, unable to support their families. And um, there's like this mythology that like, the rich don't have to pay taxes of blah, blah, blah. But we don't realize that they actually are benefiting from a system. Like they're, they, the term welfare queen is like really problematic, but like our piece, the joke was just that like Walmart, McDonald's, these companies themselves are the quote unquote welfare queens because they're the ones that are like exploiting a workforce. They're paying people so little that the people have to go on food stamps and the people are able to go on food stamps because the government is paying for their food stamps and they're taking advantage of like tax loopholes and they're pretending that they like there's like this libertarian ethos where it's like i don't want to pay taxes but it's like you drive on roads you drink clean water who pays for that you know and i think that we have lost sight of the fact that like we live in a society and when you live in a society like there are things that you have to do so that like you don't have like roving bands of poor people and so that you have like public utilities and so that you have like electricity and all these kinds of things and I'm not a socialist. I know I sound yeah. like one, <laughs> but like, I think we just were so disconnected from other people and we're this like individualist society. And so um, that piece is really incredible because we talked to this like free market capitalist guy and Sam V was a correspondent. And it was really hard to be like, why? Like the idea that like the markets determine wages is, is kind of a myth because it's not, I cannot, it's not like the, the level of astrology that's like a joke, but Sam asked him a question. She was like, what type of person, if, if, if people are what they're worth, which is what he thought, this guy is like a multimillionaire hedge fund guy, describe to me somebody worth $2 an hour. And he said, I don't know the PC term for, and then he said the R word. But, and so it's like, if that's your mindset, <laughs> where you think people who are intellectually disabled are worth $2 and you want to live in a society where that is like, like that that's where we live. Like you're just an asshole. And that's yeah. like really what it boils down to. And we were able to kind of just show like that free market thing is really just like a, a it's like an asshole mentality. And then with the Republicans, not only are they doing that, but then they're also like legislating women's bodies. So it's like you're forcing people to give birth and then you're not helping that you're just like it's just so um subjugating. And I think that's by design. And so I, I do think that like, I, I don't want to get into like politics because yeah. I, I, I honestly think that the, that, that really tunes people out. But I do think like there are more people on the left and the right who agree on baseline things. We don't want kids getting shot in schools. We want people to have control over their healthcare decisions, you know, like yeah. the majority of but because of like the political moment that we're in and the way that Which people- is fact. <laughs> which is fucking people are making so much money seeing it, you know, like yeah. Fox, there people are making so much money dividing us and making us angry that we're not yeah. able to just like talk about the real things. And like, I was just on a podcast, a like left leaning podcast, but we were talking about the culture wars and the overall conclusion to that was like, these are really convenient things for us to, for, for us to continually talk about because they're hard to define and they just make people angry and they and they tap into people's identity instead of the actual things going on, which is people can't afford to like uh, buy homes. Yeah, people can't, you know, make sure their kids are going to be safe. People are really, really angry and really, really frustrated. And like these are the things we should be talking about, but we can't because like the media ecosystem doesn't Makes enable it. that. Yeah, no, it's been, I mean, I've, as someone who's kind of existed in the worst space online for, for years, <laughs> I, I feel like the discourse, I thought it would, 
get better for some reason. I don't know why I thought it would get better. I th I feel like it was idealistic of me, or maybe I just never paid attention and it was always this bad, but it feels mu very much like I think more people, even if they don't see eye to eye on a lot of these things, there's they the average person is really just trying to live their own life and raise their kids. And like you said, pay their bills, maybe have a house, maybe have like, feel like their kids are safe wherever it is, whether it's in school or city or whatever environment they're in. And that inability to hold the leaders accountable to those questions feels partially par like part of the design too always seems more like a, at the root of all of it, a class thing that's happening in this country. And yeah. it's easier just to divide us all up and have us all at each other's throats than to have us actually looking at all of the fucking representatives who make hundreds of millions of dollars. How are you? <laughs> like that's the thing that kills me. With that one guy's rant on TikTok, I forget his name, where he was going, he it was like after Roe v. Wade was overturned, he's like, stop fucking sending me emails, Democrats. Like, and then he starts listing what all of the, and this is bipartisan, everybody's worth, and it's hundreds of million. million yeah. I, yeah, well, that, be insane. Well, it's like what it takes to be a good leader is kind of the opposite of what it takes to get elected. I think you have to be such like a brown noser and have such an ego to like want to be a politician in either party that it's just and then and then their terms are short. So it's like people make all these promises and then they don't deliver and then or their terms are forever or their and, terms are and forever they're 90 and then years old <laughs> they're 90 years old and they're like dream they're not even yeah yes that too um and then it just everybody's just kind of jaded and then people feel disenfranchised and then they are and then they stop voting and it's just it it's it is a mess and then whenever i talk about it people are like well why don't you run for office i'm like are you kidding me like i would <laughs> never do that yeah why would you want that? And that is the thing the people who should be running for office would never want to. It just is it. And then once you get that power in order to even get there, I don't know how many principles you have to sacrifice well, along the, the way. And with campaign finance, like, you, you know, it's it costs so much money to run an effective campaign. And so you're in everybody's pockets before you're even in office. Like, that's a whole, I mean, there's so many issues that like we could just like, uh, but like the Citizens it's United so... ruling was like a death knell in our democracy. If that's even, it's death. I've never yeah. said that. Death phrase. knell? I think death that's knell. correct. It just was like, it, it killed our, our democratic process. There's this really good book called Dark Money by Jane Mayer, who's a New Yorker writer. I listened to it. I didn't read it. I listened to it on Audible <laughs> and it was great. And it was really disturbing about just like how dark money has hurt democracy. Do you feel like there's a difference between listening to and reading? Is that why you made that distinction? Yeah, because I don't want to, I'm trying to be more relatable, you know? <laughs> I don't read you guys. I don't have time. <laughs> but when you listen, you can like do other things at the same time. Yeah. So my husband is kind of a snob about I, I was only laughing because my husband's a very big snob about people who are like, I read all these books. And he's like, did you or did you listen to them? I listen when I read a book, I'll tell you I read a book. I did read this one book by Maggie Smith. It was like this divorce memoir that just came out. And I felt so bad because my husband, I'm like in bed. And I'm like, this isn't about you. I'm just <laughs> She's like talking about her divorce. And I'm like, I'm just uh yeah, the the situation, it's it's weird to be like, um, I don't know when comedy it all just became political. I just I, I want to go back to like the Jerry Seinfeld days where you're like, do what you deal where Bill I Cosby do. was like revered? Well, no, maybe not when Bill you know, Cosby the, was revered. like the rose colored glasses is a real thing. I feel you, too. I'm like, I want to go back to the days where like everybody at the comedy cellar was racist and problematic <laughs> and nobody said anything because we didn't have social media. Yeah, it does feel like it's it, that was the thing that bothered me. There was always so much camaraderie with the comedians. And it, I know there's like problematic parts of comedy in the past, but there did always feel like a certain amount of like all comedians were somewhat in it together. And then it just there was a big um, there seemed to be a big rift. You have a chapter about this in your book, kind of about cancel culture. I Not have to talk about cancel culture, but yeah, no, I do. I 
I agree with you. I So I had this moment, I'm afraid to say his name because he's such a troll, but around, it was really like around like the kind of uh, 2016 election when there was all this stuff going on online. And I just kind of felt like everybody was being divided and it felt like something weird was going on. And uh, I don't want to get, I don't even want to get into it, but I did... I did like get some shit from Jimmy Dore about something. And I wrote back, I was like, like a private message. And I was like, comic to comic, like what, why are you, you know, I, cause some guy I was in, a, I did a show in London and some, and I was like, it was a work in progress show. And I was talking about the 2016 election. And there were a lot of people online who I'll say the term Bernie bro, which sorry, that might be problematic. A lot of Bernie supporters. And I appreciate Bernie's message too, but I just saw so much hate with like the Bernie versus the Hillary camp. And I was like, you guys, like, this is gonna fuck us. You know what I mean? There's a lot, there's like Trump, which like, I would like for him to not be president. Can we all just get along or whatever? And I got so much shit for that. And then I did a show in London where I was like working it out and I was talking about this stuff on stage and some guy in the audience was heckling me about Bernie. And I went online after, and I thought it was kind of funny that it was like a Bernie supporter in London that like our politics was so got like so global because of social media that some guy who doesn't even like live in the country where this politician <laughs> is running comes to my show and is heckling me. And I tweeted something about that. And then it went viral and Jimmy weighed in. And then people really came after me and they were like, like saying that the show didn't even happen, like that I'm making this up. It was crazy. And now I know that it probably was amplified by like trolls and bots and also people. But then Jimmy weighed in and was like, God, and I, and I, and I just remember him being a comic. I didn't know at that time that he was making so much money being the person that he has become today. And so that was my like wake up call of like, this is a totally different landscape. People are making a lot of money having really strong political opinions. That's my baby in the background. And he's got strong political opinions. And he already. is strong. He's like, <laughs> he's like, you're not fucking funny. <laughs> he's heckling you. He's heckling me. And, and like, it's, it's hard to talk about this because I know how I come across to people. Like, I, I feel like as like a woman on the internet with like a kind of progressive or leftist bent, even on a, was a woman with a right, I mean, like we're targets no matter what, but that was my wake up call that like, we're in a new territory where it's not comics again, you know, it's not, it, there's not the camaraderie because also people are making comics are making a lot of money amplifying the div div divisiveness and feeding into like the political apparatus that is trying to divide us. Yeah. My only, my only thing is like the daily show and places are, we're making money, a lot of money off this too. So yeah, is that is just that there's more diversity in the ecosystem now that we can see there are more people making money off of it. And it's not just, you know, the, Viacom. <laughs> yeah, no, you're that that is a totally fair thing. I think that so I work for the Daily Show. I I, I like to believe that we like I know for a fact that we like rigorously fact check. We were like not trying to we were trying to go after the powers that be like my favorite example is I did a piece on mcdonald's um factory farming things and like mcdonald's was a sponsor of the daily show and we were we went after our sponsor and we were allowed to because nobody told john what to do it like came from john mm -hmm. and that did make money for viacom but it wasn't like i i mean i remember i don't know if you know the show redacted tonight oh lee camp lee camp show so yeah. Didn't it get like completely, I had him on. He talked about how it was like completely freaking deleted from YouTube. I don't know what happened with it, but I remember that my friend, when the show was starting was like, do you want to work on the show? Cause I was on the daily show and he, and it was around the time where my colleagues interviewed Edward Snowden, who was in Russia. And this was like maybe 2014 or something. And um, he's like, you have full creative freedom. You can make fun of the U.S. You can make fun of anything you want. It's on RT. And I looked it up and I'm like, oh, RT, that's like Russia Today owned by the Kremlin. Can you make fun of Putin? And he's like, no. 
So oh, he wow. said that to me. So it was like kind of interesting that they had like a political show that was like more like you can say more than you can. Like there's this mythology from people who didn't work at the Daily Show that like we were censored in any, any way. We really weren't. We just tried to. It was like this weird thing where you're like doing journalism, but you're doing comedy. But and I I, I want to get back to like your point about like the left versus the right and that I do think and please correct me if I'm wrong. I do think that there is like a little more from the right leaning uh, podcasters, I feel like there might, there might be a little more disingenuousness in the process of making the stuff than from my personal experience working on that show. It wasn't like, you know, we, we covered fracking. We covered, um, I, when I got there, John was like, talk about whatever you want. You know, we'll find a way to make it funny. Like it wasn't about the cult. We weren't trying to fuel culture wars or divide. It was really just like trying to hold people in power to account and like yeah. looking at like, you know, the bullshit John would always talk about, like the bullshit mountain of like Fox News, you know, and like we're seeing it now with like everything going on, like looking at like Tucker Carlson's text of like what he actually believed versus what he said on television. Like, so that's like what I mean, I don't I don't think it's like both. I don't want to both sides it because I do feel like we were beholden to facts and we really tried to um, work in that lane. Yeah, I, I didn't. I, I loved that show back when it was John Stewart. Like it was just so, I think probably more influential on me than I realized. But I also think the kind of thing that I've seen in my just even inbox is this disillusionment with a lot of this stuff that was supposed to be rigorously fast fact check the example that comes to mind just pops into my head is this mostly peaceful protests kind of idea where someone's standing in front of a protest and they're saying it's mostly peaceful whether that imaging was just bad or whatever not even caring about how that looked that people feel like the same distrust that they they felt maybe for the right, like people from the left maybe have started to feel some of this. So that's only what that's what, what I've seen where they feel like that they're not being honest either. Like the the brokers on, at CNN aren't necessarily honest brokers either. CNN is not the left anymore. I mean, I don't know if you saw the Trump town hall, but like, <laughs> look who was look who I mean, they it wasn't even it wasn't even that they let Trump speak. It was like, it was like the people it was like a rally. <laughs> it was a rally. It was like, who did they? I just I, I was curious as to like, you need the money. Yeah. But it's like, who did they? Uh, who was in that audience? Like, how did they select the audience? That's yeah. my that's the only thing I want to know. I have no judgment. I just want to know <laughs> who was in that audience. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's been um it's been interesting because I was I was fully kind of of the left and I think my my experience hasn't I don't know that I really knew what I believed. So I well, think also even like of the left versus of the right like that's part of the problem because I do think it's like we're putting people in boxes and I think it's like when so somebody who's right leaning or whatever you want to call it listens and they see me as a left leaning person, they will tune out or vice versa. Oh yeah. And, and I that get it on the right, <laughs> but it's like that thing of like, if we just, we, it, if we stop, <laughs> if we try to like stop talking about it in these ways, you know, like I, like the whole trans, like, you know, the Bud Light stuff, it's like, are you really mad? I mean, are you really mad at somebody who's just trying to live their life? And if you are like, let's break that down. Why, why does an ad, a Bud Light ad with a trans woman upset you? What is it? What did deep down is it? It can't just be this one person trying to live their life. Like, yeah, but what I is think, it? Yeah. I think in that instance, it's, it feels like someone's making a mockery of what it's like to be a woman. Like there's a, there's an almost cartoonish aspect to it's like a performative what what like someone would think it's based in so many 
actually kind of fucked up stereotypes of what it would be like to be a woman. And that feel from what I can tell and what I've observed, that seems to be this kind of visceral reaction that I hear from from women. And I th- from, like I, from from tur- from tur- turfy women, you mean? I or mean, like- I get called a turf all the time, and okay. maybe do maybe you? So I, do you have I, any? Do you have any trans female friends? Yeah, definitely. And so, like, do you talk to them about this kind of stuff? Yeah, but I don't think they're as engaged in the culture war as as they're just trying to live their lives, right? So who is engaged in the culture war and why is there a culture war around people just trying to live their lives? That's, well, there might not be an answer to that too. As, yeah, agreed. But some, so they're, they would say some of this activism is actually hurting their ability to just try and live their lives because it feels. The tra- trans women would say that the active, that the, so. Some trans women that I'm friends with. As a non-trans woman, <laughs> or are you, are you like, you know, so I, I mean, it's even that is like so what you're saying is trans women you are friends with are upset about the bud light ad with the trans woman in it because they think that it's problematic or something well no they don't think it's problematic it's that it all of the what feels like this force forceful kind of propaganda or whatever it is they Everywhere. said your, your trans friends have said this to you. I have had, yes, I have trans female friends who have, who feel like a lot of this activism is hurting their ability to just live their lives. Like they feel as if they just were fine and wanted to live. And now because there's so much of. Is it because of the ad or because people using the ad to like amplify anger towards trans people or amplify this culture war? Because if we, if we can, if we can make it, if we can make it about trans kids in schools then we don't have to talk about guns in schools, right? Like if we can take everybody's focus here, we can like, you know, divide and not talk about the real issues and the real issues are not somebody who identifies as a, as a girl using a bathroom where they're going to be less likely to get hurt. The real issues are kids physically dying and getting shot in schools. Like gun deaths are like now, um, like the high, like the leading cause of death among kids in America, but it's easier for us to talk about a Bud Light ad than to talk about like, how do we, how do we make these places actually safer for people? But do you feel like in some of the instances that TERFs get called TERFs for, for example, men just self-IDing into prisons in, or trans women self-IDing into, into female prisons? And do you feel like that is okay? I think that we can like always like cherry pick things about like anything you know but i think what it comes down to is like nobody like it is not easier to be trans yeah. <laughs> than to not be trans and so people who identify and also you look at like kids who identify as trans and they're like suicide rates you know it's it's really sad and scary and it's just like this is a vulnerable population and i just would hope i just want to be sensitive to people who who so much want to express themselves in a certain way that if they are deprived of that, they will resort to suicide. Like this is just a really vulnerable population that I, that I just want to support. I don't have any other views about it than I want people who are nonviolent to be able to live their lives in peace. You know, like, I, you know, like I, yeah. A, and I want, I want to I support them in any way that I can. Yeah. I think I think most people feel that way, although they're you know, they draw the line at like kids. I think when you start talking about um, surgeries with minors and stuff like that, then people get very uh, upset. (laughs) But it's also like the same people who are fine about like everybody having like assault rifles. Like I don't I don't necessarily buy it. Like I, 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 I believe people get upset, but I I don't fully buy it because if you gave a shit about kids you would regulate assault rifles there is enough data if you just look at the data to show what's really going on like we could actually work together and like make kids safe that's how i personally feel 
but that said, like, I, it's also a case by case basis. Like, I mean, I think let parent, like, let, let, I would love to like, let the data and the science lead, you know, like if I, I can't personally weigh in on like kids having surgeries, cause I haven't been in that situation myself, but if it's like, if the rates are higher for kids who like self harm, if they don't get the surgery, like let's look at the data and like, let's yeah. talk to the experts. Like I'm not an expert in this territory. I also understand how easy it is to like hear a talking point of like, Oh my God, a kid is getting a gender like reversal surgery. And they don't, I don't even know if that's called that. I'm really not, but like, I can see how like people who are not in the weeds of it could have really strong points of view. Cause it sounds crazy. Just like pro-life sounds like you're killing babies when it's, when you're not, you know, that's a whole separate issue, but like <laughs> term should that term should fucking die because it's, they're not pro-life. Um, you know, these laws are actually like making it harder for women who, who want to have pregnancies and if they have a complication, get medical care. Like, yeah, I just read this like first person account from this woman, I think from Dallas, which was like horrific about Having uh, sepsis, yeah, and emotional. Like, yeah, I think having that... to carry a dead fetus to term because your hospital has these like retrograde policies yeah. that are making it harder for you to have a future kid or for you to even survive. Like that's like, I mean, that issue, abortion, is like the perfect um, kind of like microcosm around like what's like wrong with like our culture wars. When you look at the data that most people want uh, people to be able to have, um, you know healthy experiences, safe experiences in hospitals to, to, to make their own medical decisions. Um, most people are in agreement, but with, with the culture war on that specific issue, and that, that is by design, like Jerry Falwell and like the right leaning moral majority in the 1970s looked at abortion and they were like, this is a really good divisive issue that we can actually like get these religious people on our side so we can have like a, a stronger, um, presence in Washington and have more political power and do what we want to do. And it actually stemmed, it's a whole long story, but it actually stemmed from um, them wanting to get tax breaks for their private white Christian schools and not wanting to diversify their white schools. And so they needed more political power so that they could like uh, put it, Carter's administration wanted them to have was basically like, if you don't diversify your schools, you can't get tax breaks. And so they were like, fuck that. We need more political power so we can rewrite the rules. But like, we can't run on racism. So we're going to run on abortion. We're going to make this a wedge issue so that we can get th these people on our side because like who would be pro-life? So it literally came out of that. And wow. now we're in this current moment where it's like. I've never like, even heard about that. That's crazy. Yeah. I made yeah. it up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm really good at improv. Have you read my book? I'm really good at improv. <laughs> Have you read my book? Um, but like, Yeah. Oh, also, yeah, no one has a late term abortion because they want to. No one's aborting. No, you, you uh, having been pregnant and a mom, like, if you have to get an abortion at like eight months, it is like the worst decision to have that decision that you have to make with your partner and your doctor. And then the added stress of an entire, like, you know, uh, political ecosystem shaming you and causing you more trauma. It's just like, it's the meanest thing in the world. So, you know, the, and the way that we get over these humps actually, and data has proven this in countries where abortion went from like illegal to legal is just by sharing stories and um, con like connecting to people. Yeah. And, um, but even like in most of Europe, it's like 12 weeks, right? Because I think that's where most people, but it's I not about the week. Like drops precipitously the support it can't, for the it. The conversation or... can't be about the weeks because the com if the conversation's about the weeks, then we've lost because it's not about people. It's not a. It shouldn't. It can't be about the weeks. It has to be about. Right. I'm just saying, isn't that what the laws are in? I don't a lot know of the Europe? laws in, in different state in different uh, countries. Oh, okay. I think it. I think I thought that in Germany. I know my cousin's in German. I think that it, I'm not sure what it is in Germany. I thought in most of Europe it was 12 weeks, and I was reading this whole study, which was interesting to me. And I don't know how true this polling is because it's a poll, so who fucking knows. But it was basically saying it was like showing the support for um, for abortion as the terms went on. And so most people are like like you said, most people agree 
people should have the decision to abort or not abort their child up to 12 weeks. And then after 12 weeks, as it goes on, the support kind of drops precipitously. That all makes perfect sense. The thing is, <laughs> if you get into- I don't know the, if it's an actual- No, if you get in, yeah. But if you get into the weeks, like we've already lost, like the thing is, it's like you have to, if you get into the weeks, then somebody in the situation that we've seen happening, if somebody has like a life-threatening condition at 30 weeks, if we're, if we're talking about weeks and that person is still fucked and they don't get healthcare. So it has to be about right. like, just first of all, also the same people who are quote unquote pro-life are like not pro-sex education. They're trying to like outlaw contraception. They're like, so they're, they're doing all these things that are, it's not about, it's not about the fucking fetus and that, because if also it was about the fetus, then we'd also want like people who are pregnant to have health care. It's not about the fucking fetus to them. To them, it's really just about control. As somebody who had a baby who I, that I wanted, I didn't realize how incredibly subjugating yeah. motherhood is. And it so is. for these people to say that they are like pro-life, but then they're not giving women paid leave. They're not giving the fetuses health care in the womb. They, they just want to control us because like at the end of the day, if I were like a fascist, whatever, like all I would want is for people to like men and women, like if you have more kids, you have to have more jobs <laughs> like to feed those kids. You know, like it, it is it is a way for social control, a very effective way for social control. So that's really what it's about. When we get into like the the number of weeks, then we've lost because we meaning I don't know your politics on abortion, but you know, it's it, it's not about the weeks. It's about letting people, trusting people to make sound medical decisions or at least trusting their doctors as opposed to random politicians who actually don't believe what they say. Yeah, I wonder in Europe, like how that plays out where these places where it is 12 weeks, if it's a medical emergency, if there's exceptions to that, you know. I, I am, I, without looking, which neither of us have, so we have to also caveat that we're talking out of our asses. I am sure and I, I don't I actually don't fucking know, but I'm sure like, there's like I, a I hope that people are not like bleeding out from a fucking miscarriage or stillbirth in a parking lot because their hospital has these like retrograde <laughs> political policies that have nothing to do with maternal fetal health. Yeah, it's it's been it was interesting being pregnant and just seeing how because I was like you, I didn't really want to have a kid or not want to have a kid. I just never really thought I would. And then I had her, I had her at 43, I think I was. Oh, cool. Teen mom. Yeah. <laughs> Geriatrics. And um, that was just a wild and shocking experience. And I always used to joke, like the only reason that I, I was like, I, the only reason I want a kid is super dumb because I just wanted all of my periods to be worthwhile. I was like, all of this bullshit I went through for nothing. I feel like there, there should be something at the end of this, which feels like a very selfish reason to have a kid. And then I kind of just gave up on it because they said I was in menopause and then I got naturally pregnant with her. So it was like a, a crazy long story that I won't bore you with, but it was wild. And, and now I have this uh, child, but it, it has, it is, it was, it's been weird. You know, when you say, I don't know what your politics are on abortion, I'm like, I don't know if I know what they are because I, the six week ban came down in Texas, the heartbeat ban when I saw her heartbeat in six weeks. It was like the same fucking day I went into the thing and it was weird. It was a weird, I was like, I don't know how to process either one of these things at the moment. And I think I became not squishy about it. I just, because actually having a baby and seeing how dangerous and how much it takes over your entire body and life and how helpless you are, has also made me even more pro-choice in a lot of ways. Well, because it's you just like, like so many mindset. things that can go wrong. And I also yeah. think the conversation can't be fetus versus woman or womb, whatever they want to call us. It's maternal fetal health. It's the fetus and the person and the, and the host womb. We're all one. 
And it's like, <laughs> we are all cre- one. We Even all when are they're one. out, they're one. And when we're out. So if you create, if you, if you actually give a shit about maternal fetal health and, 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 you know, like have sex education, make sure that people who don't want kids or who are mentally unhealthy, like make sure that people don't have, aren't in that situation that they don't want to be in because they have access to information. Make sure that like people during their pregnancy are less stressed by just having a little bit of like more of a social safety net or just access to healthcare. Yeah. Like these are very basic things. And I think that if we let like people in power with disingenuous uh, motivations define the conversation, that's where we're screwed. But what they're finding with the data is like, if you actually have conversations with people um, who are, you know, the majority of Americans do exist in that gray area. If the conversation yeah. isn't, 12 weeks versus 13 weeks, the conversation is, here's my personal story. I, you know, like I had a child that I wanted and I, and the, the thing, the child ended up, it was, we found out it was non-viable at what, 16 weeks. And it, it would have been a danger to my life if I kept, you know, like it's, it's people actually sharing their stories. And there's like a joke about how, like, if you, we, we, we like, I try to make it a joke. It's not that funny, but like <laughs> the way to get like men to like, come on board. It's like, you know, like the, the daughter that your mistress will be forced to have, maybe someday she'll need an abortion too. <laughs> you know, it's like getting men to like frame it like it's about me, you know, or like your son could be in a situation where he could get like, but jokes aside, just tap into like the experiences that we're seeing. We're seeing what happens when you ban abortion at six weeks. We're literally seeing women dying or almost dying because hospitals are afraid to provide health care. This is a world that I think the majority of us don't want to live in. Or they're just straight up leaving those states, which leaves people in the even worse. But the especially... vulnerable people can't leave the states. Like, that's the thing. It's like. No, I mean, people, healthcare providers are leaving the states. Healthcare providers are leaving and, the states. And like rural populations, they're already so fucked in terms of the healthcare that they have access to. And now if you have healthcare providers just saying it's not worth it for me. I can't do my job as I feel I can do it. I'm leaving the state. Then it, it hurts people even more because now you just don't have enough OBGYNs or you don't have enough doctors to even be able to help the people who might even want a pregnancy. It's yeah. just like a, a weird cascading effect too, that I think we won't really see the full ramifications of yeah, it's it's like it's such a weird it's such a weird time and your book comes out at this time that's so it's it's all of these essays that are personal but it's also a lot of social commentary. What was your process for writing it and how did you kind of decide to to do this project? Um it happened at a time when there was like a global pandemic. So it was <laughs> easy to, you know, have more focus. It's really hard to focus and write books. I, I remember, you know, there are a lot of female comedian memoirs and so many of them are really great. And I just kind of, I remember reading Bossy Pants and when Tina Fey talked about her experience with Lauren Michaels and working in that environment, I love that. I love hearing about the work more so than like childhood experiences. And so as I was writing this, I kind of started writing essays. My first essay, not to talk around abortion, was like the dead baby joke chapter because I'm like, why am I the way I am? Why is my comedy the way it is? And I just remember as a kid, I loved dead baby jokes. And they're just like, they're all shock value. They're dark. They're just like these things you shouldn't laugh at. But they're also weirdly progressive because they're like equal opportunity offenders like I would I grew up in a town where I was like the only Jewish kid and um my friends would tell like racist jokes and I always felt bad about it so then I would be like well here's a dead baby joke every culture <laughs> has babies and so and then I'm like also there's something about these jokes where it's like they're so formulaic it's literally just like a setup and then the punchline is just like all shock value that it actually teaches you kind of how to be a comedian so they were like like training wheels of like jokes um and so I don't know, I wrote that chapter. And then I just kind of started I, I was like, a lot of times, like, I would have these conversations with my mom, where we'd be like walking and talking, and she'd be like, remember when that happened? Remember when that happened? So she her DNA really is very much in the book. Um, 
And, uh, but yeah, I just, uh, it, it kind of, I thought that the stories about my experience, my personal experiences, if I could have like universal themes attached to them that, that maybe it would like resonate. And I also, I don't want to be like a political pundit. I don't know if yeah. I'm going to get shit, shit from some of the things I say on this podcast by your supporters. I hope they're still listening, but I, <laughs> I just wanted to like, you know, I talk about cancel culture because it was like hard at the time to write a book about comedy and culture without talking about that kind of weird elephant in the room. And I think like being able to talk about it in more than 140 characters with like, you know, anecdotes from my own personal experiences, writing on Roseanne, um, just being in comedy, which is like this weird thing people care about. I think it, it was like, it was cool to take time to really think about what do I think about this thing called everyone's calling cancel yeah. culture. And how, how do I fit into it? And it was, you know, so it was, it was cool to, to have the space to write about something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I hope that somebody who doesn't align with me politically will still appreciate what I'm saying in the book. Cause it just really is my own experiences. It's not, I don't have like a larger agenda other than, uh, well, I got paid to write a book and it's 60,000 words and I got to make that happen and get it in on time. And hopefully I, you're share a great my writer. insight. And I do think too, your book really has so many for me, just as someone who's walked a very similar path, actually, we have a lot in common. It's just funny. We, there's just so much that we, that we've shared in terms of like the, the struggle in this industry. I think that so many people who are in this industry and your story to me just showed me how resilient and kind of determined you are because in all of your stories, there's so much grit and you just keep trying. Even in that story of your your American girls, the American refugees story, and you're so open and you are a great writer. And I will say I had two copies of your book laying around because they gave they just like flat, got them to me very quickly. I was like, hey, where's the book? And they're like, oh, we'll get it to you. Um, and so I had two copies and I have a very conservative uncle who was around and read it just like binge read it. And he was like, Hey, look, I don't agree with a lot of this. I, I there's a lot of things that I would take to task, but she's a great writer. And I, he read it and liked it. You know, he was like, she's Aww. Like, so I do think to your point, it, it, like he said, there's a lot of universal themes and there's things that he was like, you know, I like her. I, I don't, I think there's a lot of things that I would not agree with, but I like what she's saying. And I, I like the story she's telling because there's a lot of um, just, it's your own experience. All I want is to be likable. I, you reminded me of something because I do want to get back to, I want to like just quickly say one thing about the Daily Show that has resonated with me. I was working on a piece in Florida with Jordan Klepper as a correspondent about guns. Uh, it was about how the state of Florida actually at the time, and this got repealed, but they had gag orders on physicians. Physicians were not allowed to talk about gun safety with, uh, sorry, pediatricians were not allowed to talk about, were not allowed to ask parents if they had guns, to, to advise parents on how to store guns for safety. The gun lobby got this gag order in effect. Um, we kind of made fun of it. We talked to this guy, Noel Flasterstein, who was a second amendment attorney who had like a, a whole arsenal or like stockpile of weapons. And while we were with Noel Flasterstein, I don't know why I'm plugging this guy. Um, <laughs> he was nice, but nice. John announced that he was leaving the daily show. And this guy whose politics are completely different from John was like, man, I'm sad to see him go. And to me, that was like, I do feel like John, yes, it was like the Daily Show, but at the time that that show existed, John's version of it, it was before we had such a fractured media landscape, a little bit. It was like before like the kind of the 2016 election. And um, it was cool to me that, and, and John, you know, is bipartisan in a way. I mean, look what he's doing for veteran. I mean, like he's doing he's able to transcend politics in a way that I found really admirable and really effective. And I just didn't think I would ever be able to do that partly because I'm a woman. And I think being a woman in the public sphere is inherently political for better or for worse. But the fact that your uncle read that book, and I do think in a book in a format that is like so long, like there, I mean, too bad we don't read and books are being burned, yada, yada. But like, I do think there is power in like, literature and in something like that where you can really gain a perspective it's not 140 characters it's not like yeah. a, 
two minute point. bit on late night, or, yeah. you know, it's like, and, and podcasts are the same way. Yeah. So um, that makes me really happy that your uncle wasn't like burn the witch. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was really cute. He was just like, um, he's like, you know, you guys have a lot in common and just saw it. He's like, you know, you both wrote and it was very, it was very cute and endearing. You both and... were sexually harassed many times. <laughs> <laughs> you both were sexually clubs. harassed <laughs> multiple times. It's, it's hard to write a book though. It's just, I, it's something I can't, it's like my Everest. So I, I'm so impressed by anyone who it takes discipline. It takes, I think anything where you're writing about yourself and you're being vulnerable is challenging and um i just am impressed that you did it and put it out there i hope it's doing well and even if my audience doesn't agree with you i've had so many people the point of this podcast walk-ins welcome is that literally anyone can come sit down and talk to me about whatever and my audience expects that they don't expect to agree with every single person there have been people who are super far left to have come on and my and my audience I think is very like probably libertarian center right but also Bernie bros like it's very an anarchist it's very strange it's a very that strange. totally tracks to me that is not remotely strange <laughs> that fully tracks and all those people see me as like a neoliberal Hillary <laughs> shill globalist <laughs> whatever <laughs> Which? They see that they, they see me as that sometimes too, <laughs> depending. They and but they they'll they still appreciate the perspectives. You know, they think uh -huh. that that's what <laughs> I'll I'll screenshot the tweets I get. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate the perspective. They'll be like, I really appreciate her perspective. This neoliberal, whatever you call yourself. I don't. I don't call myself that. I just it was it was just uh, parroting some shit I've gotten online. Yeah, my my audience is wild. They're but they're they're. I I hope they're nice. I hope that they're respectful and nice. That is the my biggest. <laughs> I do. I do think. I mean, I've seen for the most part people getting the, like they're they seem to be a little more chill in the spaces I've been online. I think around like the gamer gatey time, it was more lawless and crazy. I think. I I don't I don't want to say that the internet has gotten more civil but i do from my own vantage point maybe it's because i've turned off certain settings <laughs> you're like filters are just so high. <laughs> you turn off the filters i turn, turn off the comments <laughs> i turn like, off the oh, comments never mind i never mind. didn't realize that i was still getting <laughs> completely pummeled what is your biggest defect of character my biggest defect well my biggest it's not a defect of character but i'm a really bad driver and i live in la and it makes it really hard that's not a defect of character i don't know um what what would you how would you answer that fuck i don't even know where i would begin spite is a big one i'm very oh. i can like hang on to um perceived either true or perceived slights for an eternity I'm very oh interesting. Like there's like an Italian mafia that awakens in my heart and is like you're dead to me now, and I won't oh. I won't let go of it. Um, oh, I guess mine would that's be probably um, my worst one. Yeah, I probably have like an undiagnosed uh, anxiety disorder, and so I probably have like uh, cyclical negative thoughts that make it hard for me to. Um, as John one time told me, I had I don't let your neuroses block you. I'm probably neurotic and that probably makes it hard for me to um get into like a kind of more meditative flow state mm, interesting and what is your biggest asset <sighs> my tits no, I'm just <laughs> i don't even know i, I love just it. like you're just as a joke your your kind of gut reactions to your to your best and worst qualities where i'm a bad driver and i have nice tits <laughs> <laughs> like so like old-timey female stereotypes <laughs> amazing amazing yeah you've heard it here first <laughs> I don't know. I guess I, I do think I, I would like to believe that I'm pretty resilient. I think you are based on what I've read and come at me, bros. <laughs> come at me, bros. No, no don't, don't. Don't come at her. Um, and okay. Yeah. That's how I end every podcast is just wondering what people, people like and hate about themselves. 
or working on and and that's healthy <laughs> try to end on a positive note with the asset what do you hate about yourself let's get a <laughs> pen and circle the part on your body <laughs> i actually think you and i should pivot to doing mommy content <laughs> together yeah, we'll make more money <laughs> i will do that with you get joe rogan to sponsor it uh, we will we will pivot to doing reviews of products because i've got mm. opinions now i have opinions now too and the kikaru and the what is that it's the little peanut that you change them on but man that thing was amazing oh um i'll show a product oh there are these i don't even know the name of them but there are these like um pacifiers that actually stay in his mouth oh really she hate, fucking hates pacifiers has since the yeah. day she was born oh you know what here's a product i will show they're called silverettes do you know what they mm, are no they're like these little silver cups for when you're breastfeeding they're made out of pure silver so that it just naturally has anti-inflammatory properties i didn't fuck with any of the ointments the ointments just create like they stain your clothes they make a mess but you just put these like little silver cups in and you can wash them. They're like, maybe they're like $50 online, but you have them for as long as you're breastfeeding. And they just like make the pain go away when you're not physically breastfeeding. And I tell everyone I know to like, if you plan on breastfeeding, take them to the hospital with you because these things are like, they're just, they're just really helpful. And I didn't know any of that. Wow. That's so cool. I didn't know any of that either. And I'm still breastfeeding. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you're not, it's probably, you're not in pain anymore, but the first, it's really for the first two months, which are yeah. like so painful. No, I, I had no, no idea. idea. I had no idea. And my husband, I was like, imagine if like a baby is just chewing on your balls for 24 hours a day, just chewing, like bite, like gnawing at your balls all day long. Sorry, yeah. that might be appropriate, but that's what it felt like. Where can we find you and your book? <laughs> You're like, don't find um, me. Never. <laughs> I don't want your audience. I, yeah, I, I, I'm not doing a ton of stand up right now, but I am. Uh, I, I'm on TikTok and on social media. Is my You're name. banned in Montana. I'm banned in Montana. The kids are the TikTok kids are cool. I, 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 I actually didn't think they would be, but I just I don't even really post. I just throw up old content that I've already done. And oh, cool. Yeah. And so you're on TikTok is at Jenna Friedman. Yeah, all the socials. And then okay. I I will be I'm doing a show in Chicago, I think in September. Okay. And where do we find your book? Anywhere that books where, are available? Anywhere that books are available. It's been a joy getting to know you. I love you. I love your stand up. Oh, thank you. And um, I hope to I wish I had met you in LA. But if you're ever in Austin headlining at the mothership, I'm excited. To, I can't wait to do that. Um, I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've been to South by a couple of times. Yeah. So let me know when you're in town. Absolutely. Really nice yeah. to meet you. Thank you so much you for uh, plugging the book and, and our spirited conversation. Yeah, it was great. Um, awesome. Thank you. It's time for the weekly check in with Bridget and cousin Maggie. Man, I have to say going in yesterday and switching on the lights to shoot that little thing we shot to promote dumpster fire coming up and then sh turning the lights off. And it took about 10 minutes. I was like, this is the dream. <laughs> it was literally like I was switching off the lights and I was like, this is what we were talking about and dreaming about for years. <laughs> no, it's true. It's going to be great. It's going to take me getting used to because it's not in a rickety old garage and yeah, it doesn't have like an echo and there isn't birds and dogs and planes and sirens and helicopters. I mean, net, don't fear because they're about to break ground on a house next door like any minute. Uh -huh. So dumpster fire will have so many background <laughs> noise and there are still dogs. We'll still have the dogs dog noises and there's at some babies. point. But yeah, it's nice. It'll be nice. to. It's nice to just be able to just get. To, to shooting. <laughs> Did we tell the story <laughs> about trying to get someone to come in and light the set? <laughs> we were trying to get someone to come in and light the set. And I had made a connection with somebody in our kind of neighborhood through like a Facebook page. Uh-huh. 
And he seemed like totally down for it and was he seemed to know what my content was or at least he went and looked and was like oh it looks like you're building a nice like youtube channel and I'm like well you know incrementally slow glacial <laughs> speeds but this is over the course of a couple weeks like she was in touch with this guy and then they couldn't find a time and then he seemed to disappear and then well she was no in- he didn't seem to disappear i was like hey he's like how is setup coming and we had done that like <laughs> initial but, setup. But wait, because then she was in touch with someone else and li- this is one night bridget's sitting there being like why do all these lighting people disappear on me <laughs> And then I was like, I've been sending them a picture of the set. Maybe that's why. And then I showed Maggie the picture and she's like, you fucking moron. Why are you sending that picture? You're sending this to people. And it's just like this jank. You know what our set looks like, but. We'll post it with this. We'll post it with this uh, check-in. You know, Karen's off to the side. She has no clothes on because we hadn't had a chance to dress her. I'm sure that dude's wife was like, what the fuck? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, we'll post the the picture in the community <laughs> so you can see. I laughed for like twenty minutes. You I know was that like, meme "What that, are you doing?" I need to learn how to make memes. You know that meme that go, that's going around and it's like the cut from I don't even know what movie it is. It's from it's the 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 actor in Home Alone. What's his name? Macaulay Culkin. No, no, no. The one of the criminals, Joe Pesci. Joe Pesci, where he's like, "What the fuck is this piece of shit?" <laughs> <laughs> and it's like they put it in front of everything now. Like it's the one that I showed you of like when someone from Target, Target goes, goes to Walmart. Walmart. Yeah. Like when I when Bridget sends anyone a picture of the dumpster <laughs> fire set, they're like, what the fuck is this piece of shit? I don't want anything to do with it. And oh, Bridget had a friend in town who's like, you know, like a professional in the industry. And they were like, oh, no, you never send them a picture of your set. <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> I was like, this is the picture you've been sending. (laughs) No wonder people have been ghosting you. (laughs) I had to reach out to the second guy. I was like, you know, it's come to my attention that perhaps, (laughs) perhaps you wouldn't want to be associated with such a janky production, but I swear we have advertisers (laughs) for now. Yeah. And so he did eventually come and uh, we were laughing just about the, the jankiness of our setup and, and, you know, there's the cardboard cutout of Elon. And he was like, what's this for? And we were like, oh, that's Bridget's nemesis. <laughs> it's all so dumb. <laughs> it's, as, it's as dumb as our culture is. Mm-hmm. It is the show the culture deserves. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. So it's been fun. We're, it's taken a little bit longer because I wasn't feeling well, but also just finding somebody. I mean, it, it's only been, it'll be six weeks this this weekend yeah. that we've been here. And I'm like, why aren't we up and running like operationally? Yeah. And, you know, we've got to figure out our strategy now for our shooting space. We need to have... Like we need to, sorry, loyal fans of Dumpster Fire, but the set is going to change. The background's going to change. We're not sure yet, quite yet what we're going to do with it, but um, we've got to put a strategy in place so that we can shoot multiple things in one spot. It's going to be great. Yeah. So things will be evolving. Yeah. But at least we're up and going again. It's been nice to be working. I loved, I loved it. I know a lot of our our listeners will probably have, and even Jenna says it, she's like, your audience is going to hate me and they're going to call me this like liberal, blah, blah, blah. But I'm always just so grateful that people like Jenna are willing to even come on the podcast and talk to me. And I think at the beginning when she's talking about her mother, there's just, I don't want us to lose the real human elements of one another and be tricked into thinking everybody is our enemy because I, I personally, it's strange. Like she's really one of those comedians. I just always looked up to just whether or not I agreed with her. She's a great writer and comedian. Yeah. You know, she's good at her craft. No, I really enjoy the diversity of opinions that you get on the podcast and, you know, people from different backgrounds and different walks of life. Cause I do think you're, you're trying to 
show us <laughs> our own humanity in a way where we all have stories and struggles we overcome. And yeah, you might not, a, a lot of our audience doesn't agree with a lot of what people say, but that's why I like our audience. Cause I think they're open-minded enough to listen. Well, one of the things that I recently I just got done recording a podcast with Jacob Siegel right before we started recording this check-in. And the thing that struck me the most about his piece and what I don't want to do to my audience and what I see a lot of these media outlets doing by sake of siloing their audience and who they present to their audience Mm. is not trusting them to make up their own mind about things. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I've learned really from observing Rogan. He just lets people talk and allows his audience to form their opinions. Right. And he pushes back when it, he wants to push back, not because he feels like he should or he has to, but when he's like, ah, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? Right. And really just lets his trust that his audience knows their own mind. What Jacob was saying in this piece and on the podcast, which everybody should listen to and read that piece. It's called a guide to understanding the hoax of the century by Jacob Siegel on tablet. It is brilliant. He's just a brilliant mind and a brilliant writer. And he was saying the thing that these, this tech technocracy tech, 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 I can't even talk anymore. He was saying that they don't trust people to make up their own mind. One of the things that they are attacking is it's like cognitive warfare. Wow. And it's and cognitive disinformation, which is essentially people don't know how to make up their own minds and can't be trusted to. Wow. And that's why I love having such a diverse array of guests. And it's funny, they'll often talk shit about other guests we've had on the show, you know? It's, yeah. And I see this on Rogan too, where it's, you know, you're having a, a diversity of thought when people are kind of throwing other people that I've had on the podcast under the bus. <laughs> it's good to listen to people you disagree with. It is. It helps, you know, a formulate your own like reasoning for why you disagree with them. But it's also just you might learn something new or you might hear something you needed to hear. Or or more importantly, you can still understand that this is a human, even if you might disagree on things, who has like we all lose a parent. We all go through tragedies. And I feel like that's what gets lost when we... And this is the something Jacob was saying today. We've been tricked into dehumanizing our fellow Americans by this state and corporate apparatus. Right. And that's what makes him furious. He's like, the thing that enrages me the most is that people have been tricked into hating one another. And I don't want to be tricked into that because people are so fired up in their own self-righteousness. Yeah. It's so gross. But yeah, I was like, how do we get out of this? And he said, "There, you have to go through it. Yeah. But I don't know that there's a way through it. It's pretty disheartening. Well, I think the way through it, the only thing you can do is continue doing what you're doing, which is talking to different people and, and putting it out there. You know, you're trying to combat it in your own tiny little slice of the internet That's all we can do. They're going to make sure it stays tiny. Oh, yeah. Forever. (laughs) For the rest of our lives. It's okay. It's okay. It's probably better that way. No, it's fine. It's fine. As long as I get to do it. And look, we're making making a living enough of a living. Yeah. So I'm grateful. There's We have a core group of supportive people and it does, even if it incrementally grows, it grows. Yep. And I think people have a lot of options of things to listen to. Absolutely. Any person who takes the time to listen to us... (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. Like that's that's your time is valuable your and precious. Is valuable. We appreciate the And I know there's a lot out there. There's so much that I want to listen to that I don't have time to listen to. So yeah. I get it. I'm grateful for any little sliver of attention that I can grab from the peoples. Our own family doesn't listen to I, I know. Maybe like one or two. One or two out of like 120. <laughs> and that's probably for the best as well. Yes. <laughs> Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems.
I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-Ins Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>